Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our web show, It's All in Your Head. My name is Angie, and I am here with Dr. Paul Swingle to talk about the neurotherapeutic, the neurotherapeutic treatment of severe anxiety conditions. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Swingle. Prior to moving to Vancouver, Dr. Paul Swingle was titular full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa a fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association. Dr. Swingle was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and attending psychologist at McLean's Hospital in Boston, where he also was coordinator of the Clinical Psychophysiological Physiology Service. Dr. Swingle is a registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain was published by Rutgers University Press and it is available at soundhealthproducts.com. During this web show, you are welcome to send us questions. We will have two Q&A breaks to go over these questions, so please do not hesitate to send them to me. You can also do this by using the chat box that is located on the control panel. Okay, let's get started. Let me welcome Dr. Paul Swingle. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Well, today we're going to be talking about the treatment of severe anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are very interesting and uh, very complex. Uh, and we're talking about severe anxiety disorders now. Uh, we get many, many different manifestations of this, and it's very often misdiagnosed. <clears throat> We have a notion in our heads that uh, if a person is very, very anxious, you're going to see it. That is, they're going to have a lot of uh, twitching and movement and rapid speech and <coughs> uh, sweaty forehead and so forth and so on. We have a lot of individuals who are suffering from very severe anxiety conditions and their affect, that is their emotional states, are very flat. They seem very calm, but they're just churning up and, and uh, ferociously internally. Now, the advantage of the neurotherapeutic approach to this is that we have a look at the brain and how the brain is functioning so we can see these anxiety conditions or the predisposition to these conditions based on the neuro neurology of uh, uh, what we're uh, assessing here. So, first of all, let's look at one very simple mechanism that's associated with a very severe condition that's an anxiety condition and very often misdiagnosed. This is what's referred to as the alpha response. We put an electrode on the back of the head and we look at the difference between when your eyes are open and when your eyes are closed. And what I'm going to show you here is a relatively normal alpha response. You're going to see the brainwave activity, and then all of a sudden you're going to see a jump in the amplitude of the activity in the 8 to 12 cycle a second. And then when the eyes are reopened, you'll see it drops very precipitously. So this is what it looks like. Now, this is a relatively healthy spectral analysis in which you see the green are very slow waves in the brain, two or three cycles a second, and they're very strong, and the fast ones up around 40 are quite weak. So we have what we call an inverse, now there's the alpha response right there. See that blue jumping? That's when the person closed their eyes. Now, when she opens her eyes, it will drop very precipitously. It should. When you get to be my age, you have to watch that to make sure that you're getting very good brain functioning. There it goes. Okay, there's a nice normal brain uh, uh, alpha response. And as I was saying before uh, the eyes were closed there, we have what we call a, an algorithm of what we want to see in brain activity, and that is the strength of a waveform should be inversely related to frequency. In other words, the slow waves should be stronger than the fast waves. Now, and this 
is a, a, uh, an alpha response that is not a normal response, not a healthy response. And it is the, uh, uh, has been affected by the person's being exposed to a severe emotional stressor, trauma in other words. So this is what we call the trauma response. Okay, now here's the spectral display. And you can see the slow frequency isn't quite as strong as it was in that other person. Now, you're going to see that when this person closes her eyes, uh, Alpha tries to come up, but it can't quite get there. Okay, it's being pushed down, that's what it looks like. I treat a lot of artists for artist block, it's always this they've experienced a, an emotional stressor or one has emerged from the past and it blocks their creative waveform. So this is a trauma reaction, okay? Now what is the <clears throat> consequence of that? Well the consequence of that can be what we call pseudo-seizure disorder. Now pseudo-seizure disorder, what's happening is the individual is having a seizure-like episode to block the emotional impact of trauma. Now, in post-traumatic stress disorder, very often you get these kinds of things. Now, seizure can look like an epileptic seizure in which the person falls to the floor, starts uh, thrashing and so forth, but it can also look like they're falling asleep. So they have kind of fainting <coughs> types of behaviors. Now, this is what it looks like if you're looking at the electrical conductivity of the skin. So uh, what uh, was happening in this person with pseudo-seizure disorder is the body was becoming more aroused. In other words, <laughs> this person was becoming more aroused. And when the arousal passed a certain threshold, in this case, six micromoles, and this is a measurement of body arousal, arousal of the central, of the, uh, syst uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, peripheral nervous system, when that, uh, uh, goes above a certain level, a seizure occurs. When it drops, and then another seizure occurs, and again, it's quite definitive here. So what we're having is a situation in which the brain, so to speak, is trying to protect the person against the emotionality associated with that trauma. Now, as you can imagine, this person probably has more diagnostic categories, more diagnoses than I've had hot meals because the putative mechanism, that is the mechanism associated with that behavior, has not been correctly identified. So this uh, person uh, diagnosed with seizures, diagnosed with malingering, all kinds of things, bipolar disorder, you name it. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about severe anxiety conditions. Very often the way the client presents themselves, him or herself, when they come into the office would suggest all kinds of other issues, not fundamentally an anxiety disorder. Now we're going to be looking at a lot of the factors that influence anxiety, that is influence our ability to tolerate stress. <clears throat> Now, first of all, we have neurological predispositions, and I'll be going over those in detail with you. We're born with a lot of genetic predispositions for all sorts of things. Doesn't mean we experience them. It means we have a predisposition for them. One in particular is stress resilience. So uh, if you send a soldier into a combat theater, uh, some of them are going to develop post-traumatic stress disorder whereas others who experience exactly the same thing will not be disabled by it. They may have bad dreams, they may need counseling, they may need marital counseling because of some of the legacy associated with what they've been experiencing, but they're not disabled by it, that is they're not hospitalized. And part of that is what their, their brain looked like when they walked into that the combat theater, in other words, a genetic predisposition. Another thing that we're going to be looking at is a brain activity that's associated with emotional dysregulation. 
And what that means is that if a person becomes anxious, they're going to manifest that in a different kind of way. They may become very talkative. They may become very irritable and so forth and so on. So we have two things that are interacting here. One is an emotional <coughs> a genetic predisposition for emotional dysregulation. The other is poor stress tolerance, two separate areas in the brain. And then another thing we're going to be looking at is activity that's associated with the same dimension as obsessive compulsive disorder. And that is you get a thought on your mind. It's very hard to get it out. What we call perseverative thought processes. And this can be problematic. You experience something and you can't let it go. Now, this can affect both the impact of the anxiety and can also affect how you manifest it externally. So, for example, you get irritated by your child for some reason. You just can't let it go. Okay. And that's because you're in a state of anxiety. It's precipitating a, a response, an anger response, for example. And it gets caught in the perseverative thought process, and you can't let it go. So the study of anxiety disorders is very, very fascinating. So, what we're going to be talking about here is we're going to be talking about the frontal cortex, right and left frontal cortex, and we're going to be talking about issues such as balance. How balanced are these two areas? The second is, do we have waveforms up in this region that would be affecting emotional regulation? Now, in addition, we're going to have a lot to say about our buddy right here, the back of the brain, just above the cerebellum here. And this is an area that's associated with stress tolerance, stress resilience, and so forth, the sleep quality. Sleep is a big issue in uh, the ability to tolerate anxiety and stress. Okay, and then we're going to be looking right in this area here, right in the center. And that's an area of the brain that's associated with perseverative thought processes. So let's start off with <clears throat> probably the most critical element in all of this, and that's sleep quality. We have a saying in our business, fix sleep, you fix 95% of any problem. Uh, during sleep, we need about an hour of deep wave sleep, and that's when the body restores itself, transfer poisons in the muscles, and so forth and so on. You need about two hours of what's called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and that's when the brain repairs itself. <clears throat> and if you do your own psychotherapy during REM sleep, and very importantly, that's when the brain does all its filing. So if you've learned something during the day, then in REM sleep is when the brain puts it in the various files so that you can access it. We get a lot of college kids who come in and <clears throat> they uh, study and they say, I knew it cold the night before the exam. I went into the exam, nothing. The problem is poor REM sleep. Okay, so what we do if uh, we have a persistent sleep problem is we have sleep monitors and we send the monitor home. It's an EEG device and we measure the brain activity over a night's sleep for four consecutive nights. It's not like the snapshots that you get you know, when you go to a sleep lab where you're sleeping in a strange environment and they get about a four hour snapshot. Those are valuable but this gives us an idea of how reliable those measures are over a four-night period. Now, here's a person who's severely deep sleep deprived and REM deprived. This person, as you can see, is either in light sleep or awake. Very, very poor quality sleep. So not only does this person have a lot of problems physically, because deep sleep isn't anywhere near what this person needs, and the brain uh, and the cognitive processes are all uh, suffering because of very, very inadequate REM. Ballpark figures, you want an hour of deep, you want two hours of REM. Here's a guy that has pretty decent REM, two hours, but very, very deficient deep wave sleep. 
So here's the, I'm exhausted all the time, et cetera, et cetera. And, but look, he's sleeping eight hours, and nobody can figure out what the problem is. You know, you get eight hours of sleep, you wake up tired. What's your problem? Well, your problem is the sleep architecture, as we say, isn't adequate. You're not getting adequate deep sleep. Here's a person that has adequate deep, a little on the light side, but <clears throat> only half the REM, less than half the REM of what, what is required here. So here's the problem with uh, very poor processing of emotional states and uh, very poor filing away of stuff that uh, was learned during the day. Now, excessive sleep can also be a problem. It can also be a reaction to anxiety and stress. The old notion of I'm going to hide under a blanket so that life doesn't <coughs> uh, impact on me. Well, excessive sleep can be a very, very serious problem. And the older you get, the more serious the problem. You can get caught in a situation in which the more you sleep, the more tired you become. The more sleep you need, the more tired you become. A very, very serious problem with uh, uh, the elderly. And <clears throat> the other very common thing we see is depression that isn't depression. And what we mean by that is this. This is what we call anxiety-based depression. This is an individual who has a very severe <clears throat> uh, deficiency <clears throat> associated with stress tolerance. Now, the first thing that this person has is the trauma marker. Now, remember what that trauma marker looked like when I showed it to you. That is insufficient amplitude that is increase in alpha when the eyes are closed. <clears throat> Here at right on top of the head, <clears throat> excuse me, right on top of the head it's about 18 percent. We want it above 30. In the back of the brain it actually goes negative. We want it above 50. So we know that this person has been exposed to a very severe emotional st uh, stressor. Now, You'll notice this person has a long history of what he's calling depression, a long medication psychotherapy history. Now, his trauma may be associated with his feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. Now, what's causing what he's calling depression and what he's been treated for? He's been treated for depression. Well, remember we were talking about the back of the brain, our buddy in the back that's sitting right over the cerebellum. And here we have a ratio that we use to measure how much stress tolerance a person has. And this is the ratio of the strength of very slow frequency uh, activity in the brain. Those are those very uh, uh, large uh, amplitude slow waves that were over on the left side of the screen, of the first uh, screen that I showed you, the uh, uh, alpha response. And the ratio and should be sitting around two. That is, the, the slow frequency should be roughly twice what the fast frequency is. That is, the strength amplitude of slow frequency should be twice the amplitude of the fast frequency. Okay, now we see this both in the eyes open and in the eyes closed condition. So my hypothesis here, I'm starting a hypothesis. When I ever I see the uh, input of a client, I don't ask clients why they've come to see me. I take a brain map just like this, and I see if I can tell them why they're sitting in front of me. So I ask them questions. Have you been exposed to severe emotional stressor? Secondarily, <clears throat> uh, you look like you have very poor stress tolerance here. That is, uh, you have problems finding the uh, switch to turn your brain off. A lot of chatter in the brain. Uh, you also look as though you may have a sleep problem. That is, sleep quality may be problematic here. And this can also interfere with your ability to concentrate. There's just too much chatter going on in the head. Now, the other thing we look at are, does he have any depression markers? Now, there are very specific markers in the brain associated with depression. Remember when I showed you the rotating brain? I said that we were going to be talking about the front part of the brain in terms of whether we have balance or not. 
Now there are several markers associated with depression and he doesn't have any of them but he has yet another marker for severe anxiety and that is when you have marked elevation of fast frequency in the front part of the brain and here we see it right here this beta the beta amplitude is sitting at roughly 22 in both cases here and it should be lower than each one of the other waveforms, alpha and theta. Remember what I said in the beginning, that there should be an in inverse relationship between amplitude and frequency. The fastest frequency, beta, should have the lowest amplitude, followed by the next fastest, which is alpha, and the least should be that is the one with the strongest amplitude should be the theta. Okay, so poor stress tolerance because of the back of the brain. He can't shut the brain off. <clears throat> there's just the uh, front part of the brain is just chug chugging along and there's nothing that can slow it down. So he's got two markers for stress. He's got a marker for uh, having been exposed to an emotional stressor. Now let's go to that area over the front part of the brain and the mid part of the brain. Remember we were talking about perseveration and we have a measure of that and what we want this measure to look like is of roughly half of what it is. So I know that he gets something on his mind, he can't get it out and then he's fretting and worrying. So he's got the perfect profile for severe anxiety. Not a thing in this is suggestive of depression. The reason he's depressed is because he feels out of control. He feels hopeless. Nothing that they're doing is doing any good for him. He's been at this for 40 years and they've been treating the wrong problem. This is an anxiety problem, not a depression problem. You can give any depressants till the cows come home. Nothing's going to happen other than sedation. And that's where these individuals get to, is more and more efforts to sedate. So and this is my effort at trying to show you the areas of the brain. So the first thing that we know is that there's a deficiency in the back. That's a stress tolerance marker. We also know that, <coughs> excuse me, there's much too much beta sitting up in this region in the brain. We also know that that area right in the frontal uh, center midline is very hot and that's the perseveration. Get something on your mind, you can't get it out. He also has elevated slow frequency over here, which I didn't mention earlier, and that's emotional volatility. Okay. So he's got a perfect storm going here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Swingle. We have some questions um, that we're going to go over now. Um, the first one is, um, I went to a therapist several years ago who told me basically that I was the only person who could make myself anxious. Isn't anxiety a genetic problem? My mother was always very anxious and I think her mother was as well. Yeah, and what we've been talking about here, uh, you have both experiential factors, and that is when something happens to you, and you have genetic factors. Now, the one we just looked at here uh, basically answers your question, and that is the deficiency in the back of the brain is a genetic predisposition. Doesn't mean it's not co correctable. That's where it's come from. The brain is very plastic. We've done a lot of work on brain plasticity. Uh, everybody <coughs> has seen all of the uh, articles on this over the last 10 years or so. We can do a lot with the brain even if it is a genetic predisposition. Okay. Now, to be fair to your therapist, if you realize you're getting yourself into a real snit, then there are some things you can do for yourself such as you know deep breathing and so forth and so on. We'll mention some of these uh, later. But to do a little homework in terms of finding what it is that you can do that rapidly helps you quiet down a bit. And we do things that are uh, like uh, heart rate variability, which is associated with finding a good breathing rhythm 
for yourself that will help quiet you down. There are acupuncture points on the body that you can self-stimulate that will help with quieting and so forth. So in that sense, you do have some control yourself over the extent to which your anxiety is manifesting. Thanks, Dr. Swingle. Um, another question is, um, I have found that using NFB to increase the theta beta at O1 sometimes increases ADD tendencies, that is increasing the slow waves in the front of the brain. Is there a way to prevent this? <clears throat> uh, yeah, the question is somebody's using neurofeedback to increase slow frequency amplitude in the back of the brain for quieting, but they're finding a corollary increase in slow frequency in the front of the brain. Uh, this is a pretty technical question. The reason this might be of concern is if you get an increase in slow frequency in the front, it can affect cognitive efficiency, got cognitive processing and so forth. And you do find some correlations between the front and the back. And generally speaking, uh, when you get an increase in the front, uh, very often that's a, uh, an adjustment that's taking place that the brain is readjusting itself. However, if it's excessive, <clears throat> then you can use something like the sweep harmonic uh, that is um, targeted specifically at the front part of the brain. This is a sound that people listen to that will suppress the uh, frontal slow frequency. The other is just to go up and do a very quick suppression because if it's transitory it will correct pretty rapidly and just add that as part of the uh, treatment session. We do that very often, do more than one site. Thanks Dr. Sengel. I have one more. Do you have experience using lamotrigine? This is an anti-epileptic for anxiety. Yeah, a lot of people are uh, prescribed uh, lamotrigine. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. <clears throat> uh, it depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Are you trying to uh, give a person a, a temporary, uh, uh, temporary uh, help with the anxiety while you're doing some other therapy? Now, if that's the case, people have done things like uh, use uh, beta blockers, for example, propranolol. Uh, and what that does is take the edge off while you're actually doing something like uh, working with the person's trauma uh, or doing some uh, anxiety neuro neurotherapy. Um, <clears throat> but there are a lot of off-label uses of things for severe anxiety. And it depends, as I said, you know, n no medication should stand by itself. What else are you doing? Neurotherapy shouldn't stand by itself. What, are you, what else are you doing? It's, you know, it's part of a package to correct the situation and help the person sustain and maintain it. Thanks, Dr. Single. We will continue and we'll have another Q&A break. Okay. <clears throat> Very often we get children coming in with a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, and um, uh, I've just finished the manuscript called, Are You Sure It's ADD? Uh, we see a lot of this in which has nothing at all to do with ADD. There are no ADD markers at all. And what the, is happening is the child is frightened or the child has poor sleep or all kinds of other things that are associated with the problem of poor performance in school. The nice thing about doing a brain assessment is that the brain tells you absolutely everything. And what I'm seeing here is a very, very mild elevation of a ratio that's associated with an attention issue. We want it below 2-3, this kid's sitting at 2-3-2, okay? So the other thing I'm seeing, however, is he's got a trauma marker, and he has a trauma marker in one of two spots, and in the spot that I'm seeing the marker, that's that 18.78 that you're looking at on the top left hand of the screen here. Uh, that's very often something that is either recent or ongoing, okay? So I have a hypothesis already. And whatever little difficulty this kid may have with an attention issue, it's being strongly exacerbated by a, uh, some emotional experience uh, that he's uh, going through. Now, I look at the back of the brain, and I see that he uh, very likely has a sleep issue here because the ratio associated with sleep 
a little on the low side for somebody his age. So I'm having, again, a hypothesis that the child is not able to deal effectively with emotionality because of the sleep issue. Now the front part of the brain, bingo, here we go. And this child is showing a very large marker for reactive depression. <clears throat> and reactive depression is when you get slow frequency amplitude that's elevated on the right side of the brain. I'm sorry, the left side of the brain. And that's usually reactive depression, something going on right now. The other thing this kid is showing is he's showing a pretty substantial elevation in uh, slow frequency theta up over the right prefrontal orbital cortex, and that's associated with emotional volatility. Okay, so I have a nice hypothesis here. This kid is highly emotional and highly reactive. He's a sitting duck for a bully because, you know, he when a bully comes over and yeah, yeah, and pokes him, he starts to cry. Okay, bullies love that. <clears throat> the second is he's uh, experiencing a severe emotional stressor, the bullying, and he's very depressed about it. Okay, so that's what I find out. I ask the uh, the parents about it. Uh, they ask the child, and the child breaks down crying. He was afraid to tell his parents. You know the usual bullying uh, protocol profile here. Parents went to the school, got the thing sorted out. We did a little neurotherapy and <clears throat> a little uh, cognitive behavior therapy kind of thing with uh, this kid, and uh, sent him home. He had not. It had nothing at all to do, really with an attention deficit disorder. What we had here was peanuts. And where we found that out is what's going on right there. There was the trauma marker and it, it looked like a, uh, a uh, uh, trauma that was ongoing, a present state. And, and we were picking up uh, some, excuse me, slow frequency over here Okay, and we also saw some other things, but those, those were the telltale signs that we were dealing with an anxiety disorder that was precipitating a reactive depression. The child didn't know what to do, felt trapped. Now, we do a lot of full brain assessments. The ones I've been talking about previously and showing you is our basic intake assessment for things, you know, straightforward things to treat like depression and anxiety, sleep, to pro sleep problems, ADD and so forth that don't really require a major assessment such as this. And this one, uh, what I wanted to show you here is we're looking at one hertz, one cycle a second snapshots of what's going on in the brain. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing a lot of fast activity sitting over the right side of the brain, front part of the brain. That's a genetic depression marker. <clears throat> We're seeing a lot of uh, fast activity sitting over the anterior cingulate, and that's you get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And we're seeing a lot of fast activity sitting back in the occipital region in the brain, which is a sleep problem. Okay, So this tells us exactly what the problem is, exactly where to go to fix it. <clears throat> and something that always kind of catches people off guard when we talk about <clears throat> somebody comes in at this time of year and says, I don't know, I just feel uh, terrible and depressed and anxious and I don't know what's going on. And I say, you have seasonal affective disorder or something like that. And they're very surprised because <clears throat> Uh, everything we hear about seasonal affective disorder has to do with the fall, you know, when the uh, light is starting to decrease or not getting adequate light. But we get the opposite, and that is a, a seasonal affective disorder, but it has nothing at all to do with the fall. In fact, this person feels really good in the fall. Uh, and the light is decreasing and everything's quieting down. This person has a predisposition to poor stress tolerance and the increase in arousal associated with springtime, increased light and so forth and so on. 
uh, is more stress to the body and it's precipitating stress-like responses often manifesting as depression. Now one thing to keep in mind is stress is additive. Good stress, bad stress, mod modest stress, it all adds up. Okay? And a lot of us who get involved with lots of things that we love to do, you know, <clears throat> uh, and we can overload with positive stress. <clears throat> Too much beta sitting over here, that's a stress marker. Too much alpha sitting right across the front part of the brain, that's the emotional dysregulation that we've been talking about. <clears throat> problems with planning, organizing, sequencing, following through on things, and emotional dysregulation, so it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Deficient theta beta in the back of the brain, we've seen a couple of cases of this. That's associated with <clears throat> the ability to deal with stress, poor stress tolerance. So get something, on uh, uh, the uh, you just can't find the switch to turn your brain off, a lot of chatter going on, uh, and, uh, often uh, sleep quality problems and so forth. Front part of the brain, too much alpha, which we talked about before, and uh, what that's doing is, again, emotional dysregulation. And then when you have too much beta on the left side of the front part of the brain, here you have a combination of two things going on in the frontal cortex. Too much beta left front, that's an anxiety marker, a genetic anxiety marker. And too much alpha and right across the frontal cortex, that's a dysregulation. So you have an anxiety and the anxiety <coughs> combines with the uh, poor uh, emotional regulation and uh, these are the kinds of people that you, <coughs> you see uh, who have these uh, marked emotional responses to what everybody else would think are trivial uh, anxiety triggers. Again, another uh, combination of these things uh, is when you have too much alpha in the front. Now again, that's your emotional dysregulation. And then you have this other guy right here, the anterior cingulate gyrus, sitting right in the front part of the medial uh, front of the brain, uh, and that's the OCD area. Uh, and um, in its milder form, you know, you get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And what that does is it just creates the spiral. You get something starting, and you can't stop it. It just spirals and spirals and feeds on itself. The anterior cingulate gyrus is sitting right in here. Now there's the front part of the brain to the right and the back part of the brain to the left. And we, uh, the area that's associated with the stress tolerance is this area right in the back uh, of the uh, left side of the uh, figure here, which is sitting right over the cerebellum. And the anterior cingulate is sitting over here and that's uh, when that gets elevated and hot, you get something on your mind, you can't get it out. And then we have the front part of the brain. <clears throat> this, of course, is a uh, sagittal section right through. But we're looking at issues associated with balance in the front. And then when we're looking at our trauma markers, we're looking at uh, what happens when you close your eyes up in this region of the brain, which is right over the sensory motor uh, area of the brain. And likewise, in the back of the brain, uh, the eye. Uh, occipital regions of the brain, and this is very close to the visual cortex. So elements for the perfect storm. <clears throat> the more you have, the more perfect the storm. So first we have our trauma markers, and again that's the one that's right on top of the head and the one in the back of the brain. If you only see the one on top of the head, it's more likely to be something current. We have sufficient theta-beta ratio at the back of the brain, the uh, area in the occipital region of the brain that we were just looking at. When that's low, you have problems with uh, stress tolerance, uh, can't find the switch to turn your brain off, a lot of chatter going on, and usually sleep problems. 
Then you have legitimate depression markers here, and some of them are reactive depression markers. If somebody dies, we expect to see a reactive depression marker in the brain, which is referred to as you know bereavement. Now, we usually don't treat that because you're supposed to feel sad when somebody dies and you're supposed to work it through. We might help you in terms of stress tolerance, that sort of thing. But you don't ever want to blow that away. And this is, in my judgment, the most serious mistake in terms of the use of antidepressants. The use of antidepressants for a, depression, for a reactive depression can often create a lifelong problem. <clears throat> Frontal vigilance marker. <clears throat> this is when you have somebody who's been exposed to severe emotional traumas and what happens is there's a marker in the front part of the brain that's associated with the brain never being able to relax. That is the front part. And we call it the hypervigilance marker. The frontal anxiety marker, that's the one in which you get <clears throat> elevated fast activity in the left. And then the high frontal alpha, that's the emotional dysregulation. That's where there's too much alpha all over the front part of the brain. The emotional volatility marker, remember the uh, kid that was being bullied, uh, in which he had elevated slow frequency <clears throat> sitting up on the right side of the brain. That's uh, emotional uh, volatility. That's the kid when you know, breaks out crying at the drop of a hat, so he's a sitting duck, as I said, for uh, bullies. And then what we call the hot anterior cingulate, <clears throat> that's the area associated with the OCD, that is, you get something on your mind, you can't get it out. If you if the client has to put more energy or there's more potential for uh, uh, discomfort, the placebo has a higher impact. And this is some uh, research that was done by uh, Dr. Rita Ridford, published recently in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. And what she found was that acupuncture, you know, when you're sticking a needle in somebody, has a higher placebo impact than a benign oral pharmaceutical placebo, something a tablet you take. <clears throat> so, uh, whenever you're treating something of uh, uh, of any kind of nature, the whole concept that you're doing something makes a huge difference. Now, there's a negative side to that, and I refer to that as the silver bullet syndrome. First of all, there's very little convincing evidence for any benefit from any supplement. The benefit of supplement is a huge placebo <clears throat> in terms of <clears throat> all of the hype that they're able to surround it with. Now, I don't know about the figures, you know, the accuracy of the figures, but nonetheless, they're talking about about 58,000 supplements that are on the market that have all kinds of endorsements, and there's only 20 or so that have any compelling evidence associated with their use. Now, what bothers me about this, this notion of, you know, selling people supplements, is supplements can be harmful. You know, the fact that it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. It just means <clears throat> that it's coming from a natural source. We have people who have, we've treated for uh, electrolytic failure. Uh, because of excessive use of supplements. They're not benign. And my feeling about it is you treat what is a deficiency with some supplement. Now, <clears throat> in other words, if it works, let's call it medicine. And if you are deficient in some particular mineral, then there are ways to address that. Are there things that have some preventative uh, impact, like vitamin C? look at the literature. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> does it affect the putative mechanism? Now what I mean by that is, <clears throat> can you demonstrate that it's having an effect on your cortisol levels, 
uh, on any one of your endocrine levels, uh, on any one of your mineral uh, levels as uh, m measured uh, in terms of uh, uh, blood content and so forth and so on. Okay, Show me that it's affecting what you claim is the mechanism associated with the problem. Testimonials are absolutely useless. They mean absolutely nothing. Subjective outcome, gee, I feel good. Now, here's where our Eli Lilly guy came in, okay? All placebos are not the same. So you feel better when the placebo is blue and triangular as opposed to round and white, okay? So subjective outcome doesn't carry a lot of definitive evidence. It all depends on how we're interpreting this. Then the horse race, okay? I'm going to give you a round white pill versus a triangular, I think you said blue, okay? And the triangular blue uh, won the race, okay? A sham horse race, <clears throat> a white pill that actually contains something versus a white pill that contains nothing, okay? The definitive evidence you want is, does it affect the putative mechanism? Now, what else can you do? Lots of things you can do yourself. You don't have to come trotting into uh, us or any psychologist or whatever, or get medicated. There's some things that you can do personally. And we always stress this after we do an assessment, okay? How do we get this thing under control? And more importantly, how do you sustain it? Once we do the neurotherapy and get the brain functioning the way it should, then what do you do on an ongoing basis to make sure things are honky-dory? <clears throat> well, here's a very simple thing that they uh, <clears throat> just recently, well, no, this is 2006 by Angela Cloud. Uh, just a visit, brief one-time visit to an art gallery and <clears throat> normalized salivary cortisol levels. By the way, we do cortisol and adrenal function testing at the Swingle Clinic when we're worried about these sorts of things, uh, just salivary tests. Follow grandma's advice, you know, go to bed and <clears throat> make sure your sleep is okay. Get your lazy duff out of bed and get your lazy duff off the sofa. In other words, proper sleep and proper exercise. Okay? And the wisdom of the camel driver, you don't live in either the past or the future, you live in the present. <clears throat> Somebody recognize that in uh, the uh, uh, the Power of Now book that was uh, such a hit. Well, the camel driver knew this a long time ago. Uh, this is from uh, Paolo Coelho's uh, The Alchemist, as many of you know. Exercise for depression, no question about it. Extremely powerful, and there's compelling evidence for this. Find some exercise procedure that you like to do. Sport is a very good uh, option for this, you know, walking to and from work, bicycling to and from work, and so forth. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. Okay, now, here's one of the major treatment protocols for <clears throat> dealing with uh, severe anxiety in young people. And here they were looking at the cognitive behavior therapy and sertraline and combined and in a placebo. Now, one of the things that they found routinely, typically, is that the combined uh, behavioral, not necessarily cognitive behavior, but a behavioral treatment in combination with some medication is superior to either one alone. And of course, that makes intuitive sense. Here we have evidence of that, that at the 12 a week mark, uh, the uh, combined sertraline with uh, the cognitive behavior therapy had markedly superior positive outcome. <clears throat> the placebo was demonstrably poorer than either one alone or certainly the combination. And if you look after 24 to 36 weeks, okay, then what you find is uh, that the uh, they, the uh, areas that were 60 percent improved continued and plateaued up around the same level as the combined was at 12 weeks. 
So that sounds very positive. What it's saying is that if you get a positive response early in treatment, that is very good news because there's likely to be continued improvement. You get out of the gate a lot quicker if you use a combined, so that makes infinitely good sense. Okay, so all of this sounds hunky-dory, right? This work was just published in <coughs> 2013 in the uh, psychi uh, acad uh, Adolescent Psychiatry Journal. But six years out, <coughs> What is the long-term relief for these anxieties and disorders in children? And what we find is that not only is anxiety not good news, it's highly prevalent and it severely disrupts developmental tra trajectories. It's a gateway disorder for all kinds of health problems, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and so forth. None of this is news to any of us, but this is. The long-term effectiveness of the condition we were just talking about, medication, in this case sertraline, and cognitive behavior therapy, there was a 50% relapse rate at the six-month follow-up, uh, six-year follow-up. This just <clears throat> was done by Ginsburg in the JAMA recently. So this is telling us volumes about what we have to do. One is we have to figure out how to rapidly treat these conditions so that you give the person some immediate relief. That all makes infinitely good sense. But something that we're really bad at is follow up and making sure that the person is maintaining their condition. Now, you know, it used to be that we had our family doctor and we would check in every once in a while, and we were having a bad time, and we'd go in, and you know, he'd kind of listen, take our pulse, go, hmm, 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 and give us something, even if it was placebo, who cares. <clears throat> okay, this will take care of you, John. You know, if everything isn't hockey-dory in uh, you know, three weeks, give me a call. You know, that sort of thing. The problem is, we don't have that anymore. Okay, to try to find yourself a personal physician who has that kind of relationship with you, good luck. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. So those of us who treat these kind of conditions have an ethical responsibility to make sure that we're protecting individuals in this long-term context. We don't have a clue what's going on down the road often. Uh, what we try to do with the clinic is we do an immediate follow-up after a couple of months after treatment, then one at about six months out, and then a one a year for a while. And sometimes individuals go into what we call the optimal performance uh, area in which we are maintaining the brain at a slightly higher level of functioning as compared to what the, <clears throat> the baseline uh, uh, level would be. So in the context of coming in to do that, we're also getting a follow-up of you know, how are they doing relative to the conditions that we hoped we put to bed earlier. Now, <clears throat> this is another very important area, <clears throat> and this is severe trauma at a young age. And with severe trauma, in this case, the death of an immediate nuclear family member. From birth to 2.9 years, the increased risk of developing a psychotic disorder, effective or non-effective, is 84 percent increased risk. It drops off as the child becomes better able to cope with that for whatever reason. <clears throat> but these are huge numbers. So <clears throat> This notion that uh, you don't have to treat early on uh, in a child, I think is just absolute nonsense. We treat children, we, uh, the youngest child we've treated is three months of age. Now that was for a serious uh, uh, seizure disorder, West Syndrome. <clears throat> but nonetheless, with our brain driving techniques that we've developed, we can treat very young infants and very old, demented, uh, uh, elderly 
uh, individuals. So they don't have to be, it's not volitional. They don't have to be attentive to the screens. So many of you know all of this. The way we treat using neurofeedback, that is the common form of neurotherapy, put a wire on the head, set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, icons move on the screen. And you can have any kind of game you want or any kind of feedback you want. Brain stops doing what we want, stops. Does what we want, it moves. So very straightforward instrumental conditioning. <clears throat> you can just give the raw feedback to uh, individuals. A lot of adults just watch, like to watch the, uh, the thermometers here. The higher the, uh, the, uh, the bar there, the more the brain's doing what we want it to do. And they can watch the raw signal, you know, the one that I was showing you earlier. Brain driving, <clears throat> different deal. Here we're setting it up so that, <clears throat> in this case, we're stimulating with lights. You can see the little LED sitting in, that, uh, in those iframes and headsets <clears throat> for the individual so we can deliver sound when we want, lights when we want. And here she has electrical uh, hookups at an acupuncture point, in this case pericardium 6, <clears throat> excuse me, so that based on what the brain is doing, we can administer light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields and so forth to nudge the brain into more normal functional ranges. And this is straight classical conditioning of the brain, something that was demonstrated by Shadgill at McGill in 1940. So we have the evidence of being able to affect the putative mechanism. And this is what brain driving looks like. You know, <clears throat> the increase in alpha during the brain driving was 148 percent. Okay, so that's the kind of aggressiveness we can get with that. Dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, we did the alpha response I just showed you, and we do what's called somatoemotional release. It could be cognitive behavior therapy, whatever, to help the person process all of that locked up trauma. So we release the trauma, increase the stress tolerance, help them process the stuff, make sure it sleeps okay, and put them back in the world. Safe rooms. The kids, <coughs> Uh, when they're in school, they get into trouble. This was a suggestion of Mary Jo Sabo way back in 1998 using our uh, uh, Omni harmonic that's designed to help a kid pay attention. And this one was done recently in Kansas City. They were using the harmonic to design the quiet. And they're able to demonstrate that it decreasing the amount of time in the uh, uh, in the uh, safe room. Safe room, by the way, is a place when a kid gets out of control, they can go down to the room and, and uh, get control of themselves and then come back. It's so much superior to sending them to the principal nonsense. So we have evidence that it not only is good in the uh, environment, but it decreases the amount of time in the environment. Finally, Watching another pers person suffer <clears throat> makes us suffer. And as a therapist and counselor, we have to pay attention to this. It can affect immune suppression, vital exhaustion, depression, anxiety disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Seeing a person suffer and going through it can affect you in a very, very dynamic way. And what they're doing here is just measuring cortisol, the impact of cortisol on a very trivial stressor. This is doing math studies and being uh, interviewed in a hostile interview situation. And the number of subjects who had a cortisol effect, 95% comes as no, uh, no surprise, but strangers watching the other person, 10%, had a cortisol effect of just watching uh, these individuals in their anxious condition. Partners, <clears throat> spouses and so forth, 40 percent. And you get it whether you're looking through a one-way mirror, so no physical contact, or even on a video. Okay? And this is the news. Men and we women are exactly equal in terms of the impact on cortisol. Women admit it. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Swingle. That was very interesting. I will conclude the show with a few announcements. First of all, for those of you who are interested in learning about neurotherapy, this book is a great resource. It is called Biofeedback for the Brain. Dr. Paul Swingle is the author and, as we like to say, it is the most important book you'll ever read for yourself, your children, and grandchildren. It is available at soundhealthproducts.com. Okay, so this is, um, for those of you who didn't hear, this is um, a book for all of those of you who are interested in learning more about biofeedback. And now we're looking at the clinician's guide. It is a literature for the therapist. The book leads them through the procedures for evaluating and treating patients with a wide range of disorders. It is also available at soundhealthproducts.com. Okay, our next fundamental neurotherapy workshop is scheduled for this month on May 23rd. It is a three-day workshop, and one day out of the three is specifically dedicated to intense hands-on training. Participants will be instructed on every aspect of setup, recording, and treatment phases. Um, mm -mm. As you know, we have a wide variety of products through Sound Health Products. If you would like to get more information about these, please visit the website at soundhealthproducts.com. Okay, we also have a upcoming public lecture at the Vancouver Central Library. This is happening on June 4th at 7 p.m. This is free, and to learn more or register, you can visit our website at swingoclinic.com, and it is under events. These are some of the future topics for this year's webcast. We will be discussing addictions, learning and attention disorders, depression, emotional trauma, and more. All of these webcasts with different topics have been scheduled on our events page at swingoclinic.com. So if you're interested um, in listening to any of these live, you can register at our events page right now. Also for professionals, Dr. Swingle offers online training through the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe. You can visit the BFE's website at bfe.org to see all of the offerings of Dr. Swingle's webinars and online courses. The professionals who complete the courses can get up to 24 hours of continuing education. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching. Please join us next time on June 14th, and the topic will be Better or Exceptional.